as I, in my previous life, I was professor of surgery and head of the Department of Surgery in, in University College Dublin, and um, also consultant urologist in, in the Matter Hospital. But I, I dedicated, I was lucky enough to have a practice that I was able to give a lot of time to research. And I was able to set up the laboratory, which uh, has Bill Watson now as its head, and uh, I was extremely pleased to be able to do that. Uh, so I was exposed at that time, obviously, to urologists and surgeons criticizing my work, and indeed scientists, and uh, Mark Lawler is there, one of, among my major critics. Uh, <laughs> I kid, I kid you, uh, throughout the years. Uh, but then I became exposed, of course, gradually to medical oncologists, uh, very different, and radiation oncologists, sorry, Frank. And it was a very, very different ex experience, but very important in the development of all that. Then the next was exposure to epidemiologists. And uh, wow, that was a bit of a, a culture shock, I have to tell you, ladies. Uh, that was something that it took getting used to because, again, they were coming at, at things from a very different uh, point of view. And finally, of course, now the health economists, which is completely different and something that I'm just trying to get used to, but I think we'll enjoy, uh, hopefully, having a liaison of uh, a very nice professional kind over the years. So the Irish Cancer Society has been committed to research since its inception 50 years ago. And I, <clears throat> I want to main my, make my main point by starting off with the Irish Cancer Society. I was appointed there as head of research uh, about two years ago, and I, I saw it as my role there to introduce new research concepts, uh, to, go, to try and redirect uh, uh, the, the way that uh, research was going, and, and, and also to, to really, to, 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 I guess, drive the, the, the agenda of the Irish Cancer Society forwards very, very strongly. Um, I'm going to show you some of the stuff that we've been doing today, and I'm going to show you that it is entirely and becoming more and more patient-centered, which I believe is, is the way forward. Um, I, uh, I want to also mention Sinead Walsh, who is in the audience there t today also, who is my, I would say, I was going to say my right-hand man, but you sort of know what I mean. And uh, she really, without her <coughs> dotting the I's and, and crossing the T's and making sure I do it right, I would not be able to do any of this program. But this has been the commitment. And in the background to all of this, I just want you to remember that 95% of the income of the Irish Cancer Society is from the people of Ireland, uh, the public out there. And it's the public out there who I think increasingly are going to have a voice in research. And I'm going to just tell you what I mean by that before, before I finish. You can see that we've funded huge numbers of projects over the years, <clears throat> about 250. And uh, people, we do this very interesting research uh, uh, fellowship and scholarship programs. And, some are in the audience uh, today, and in fact, I, I'm looking at two of them uh, across there. And so this is another very exciting area where we're not thinking so much of the, the patient there, but certainly the scientist and what the scientist will do for the patients in the future time. There have been hundreds of publications in international peer-reviewed journals based on the research that's been done. And this is uh, something that, of which we are, of course, very proud. These are the four strategic goals of the Irish Cancer Society as per the five-year plan, which was launched in January of this year. And uh, you can see that in the in position three there, uh, although these are four equals, uh, is to lead excellent collaborative research. And I, 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 certainly my belief when I came to the Irish Cancer Society was that this was the way forward because collaborative research definitely made more sense than having individual people doing a whole lot of research and fighting for funds. So there, there are many challenges, as, as we saw it, uh, facing the cancer landscape, uh, the fragmented nature of the research landscape. Obviously, there are a, a, a large number of major academic institutions and affiliated hospitals throughout the country. We're a small country, but we have a lot of medical schools and, uh, this is, and a lot of universities. So we're a very well-educated population, but the money is going in all sorts of different directions. Um, 
I felt also, we felt that there were loose links, if you like, between the population-based translational and clinical research areas. And it seems that also I wanted to help with the further development of cancer epidemiology research in Ireland. Uh, and so that seemed to be a good way forward. Also, it seemed to me that if one is doing all of this, we need, above all, strong leadership. And I don't mean necessarily strong leadership from me, but certainly strong leadership from the people who are going to be involved in these particular collaborative research areas. So the first and by far the biggest <coughs> research grant that I pushed forward hard for was the Irish Cancer Society Collaborative Cancer Research Centres. And uh, you may have been incredibly bored by seeing me on radio and television last week talking about the launch of these, which we were very, very excited by. This was the launch of the first of the Irish Collaborative Cancer Research Centres. And as I say, the reason is that collaboration is definitely the way forward to the next level of research excellence because it reduces the fragmentation of research, it avoids people competing for the same grants, and it allows many, many different groups to work together towards the same goal. And also, if everybody's working towards the same goal, this will therefore increase the impact of the research. So, because everybody is now on side, we don't have people fighting against each other, trying to prevent uh, somebody else perhaps getting up to the, the next level. Our plan is that over the next period of time, we want to have five collaborative cancer research centers and each will get 7.5 million euro over a five year period. So it's a very significant amount of money and it's something that we feel is definitely towards heading towards really excellence in areas. Now it's funny because you say to yourself, why only five? Well actually, if you look around the cancer research landscape, and you look at the collaborative groups that are likely to develop, I would say five is just about right. And uh, if more uh, 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 show themselves to be present, and if somebody comes along and gives us 7.5 million, then no problem, we will increase. But they are all, it's all international peer review. The first Collaborative Cancer Research Center was awarded earlier this year and will be starting on the 1st of October, and it's called Breast Predict. And uh, it's, a, it's a collaborative group right across all of the major institutions, UCD, Trinity in Dublin, NUIG, UCC, Dublin City University, all there. And I'm pleased to say that Professor Michael Curran, who uh, had the pleasure, the great pleasure of working for me uh, some years ago, uh, is uh, one of the collaborators and uh, one of the very important, as you know, is the work that he's done in cancer research and breast cancer uh, is uh, internationally recognized as being absolutely excellent. Now he knows, of course, very well that this will involve a lot of teamwork and a lot of people getting together for the, the common goal. And you can see the logo just there at the bottom of the page. This is the sort of general way that it's going to work. And you can see in blue, I have CCRC, Collaborative Cancer Research Center, one to five. And if you just want to look at that, you see the Irish Cancer Society, which will have a, not a, a board, but a sort of an overarching committee, which will not in any way try and interfere, but at least be a way to gel all of these together. Uh, with the cancer research centers, that there will be a, a director, with a scientific advisory committee, and then, uh, of course, the other various ancillary staff. But the aim is that linking together will be this, this, this directorate, if you like, or the advisory committee will link together epidemiology, translational uh, science, and clinical science. Now, why? Well, for the old adage that, of course, if it starts with the population, it'll work right through the laboratory and end up with uh, uh, some pill on a, a pharmacist's shelf and back again to the epidemiologist. So everybody's involved several times during the whole of this. The clinical work is very important. And ICORG, as you know, is the All-Ireland Cooperative Oncology Research Group. Um, this receives most of its payment the vast majority of his payment by the HRB, but we have a very uh, excellent uh, link with the HRB, uh, in not only in this, but we're very happy to support ICORG in what uh, is, uh, we would describe as being a very meaningful way as well. Um, it's important 
because now we're getting to the patient. And there were a couple of points raised this morning that I'd like to just sort of underscore. So this is the, <clears throat> the National Clinical Trials Organization, and uh, it does uh, everything you see here. There are a lot of members, and the point is that it is actually right across Ireland. Um, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and a few of the surgical side, but you know, in a meaningful way, right across Ireland. So everybody's working towards uh, getting this uh, up and running. But importantly, uh, now on the, the board of i which I'm a, a, a member of, there are several patients. And these patients don't just sit there at these board meetings saying nothing. Increasingly, their voice is being heard. Now, that's at board level, but I honestly believe that this is going to filter down even further. And the uh, I will re repeat it when I say that the, 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 uh, the importance of the patient's voice will be heard, I believe, in the design of trials, the design of drug trials uh, in translational work, because they will be saying to us what they think is actually important. And that's a voice that we really must not forget, and I think increasingly that is going to become important. This is just a, a view of the clinical trials. And the, the great thing about it is that the organization of i is excellent. The, um, the way that you can see breast, uh, there are lots and lots and lots of breast cancer trials, uh, and they're all very, very well uh, uh, enrolled and accrued. So these are uh, 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 mainly randomized fa uh, phase three trials. Now the question came up this morning how relevant is that to the patient? And actually the answer is probably not all that relevant, to be honest, because what you're doing is you're confining yourself within this trial to inclusion and exclusion criteria, which may exclude an awful lot of patients who normally would want that particular drug. Well, okay, but it's an even playing field. You have to be fair to the pharmaceutical industry as well, because, of course, they put a huge amount of money. Don't forget, each drug costs about $1 billion. So that's, I think, a reasonable amount of money put in. Um, and so there it is. We have to uh, accommodate that. But really, when you come to think of it, a clinical trial, uh, the real life practice is what matters, and they're the trials that happen afterwards, and they're the ones that will really tell you, I think, how valuable is the drug. Uh, the point was made this morning that the prostate cancer drugs are giving a certain amount of improvement in, in life expectancy, you know, a reasonable amount, but they are above all improving the patient's quality of life. And this, I think, is, 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 an, is an extremely important thing. But don't forget, there are biases, and uh, you heard my comments this morning, and uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted to see that you're, in spite of what I said, you're, you're, you're listening to, to, to what I'm saying. Uh, the, the biases that can exist uh, perhaps are important biases, and maybe statistically they're wrong, but maybe actually medically they're important. And so I, 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 I'm, I still have an open mind about that. This is uh, something that is, I find exciting. We, we uh, do a, uh, a lot of funding with Movember. And Movember, as you may or may not know, is a group based originally in Melbourne um, and now has infiltrated throughout the world. And it's for prostate cancer. And if you see people wearing mustaches, myself included in November, please don't turn away in horror without paying me a 10 uh, euro note. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a very important source of funding. And one of the things that we're doing with them is this, uh, what we call IPCOR, Irish Prostate Cancer Outcomes Research. This is uh, endorsed by the National Cancer Control Program, and it's, it's a clinician-led project. Why is it a clinician-led project? Because in that way, the clinicians will all come and, and join with it. And I believe, and I know Frank Sullivan is, a, is a, an important part of this, I, I, I believe that the clinicians will all come together and work on this because the only way that this is going to have meaning is if every single case of prostate cancer is going to be looked at and tracked forwards over the years. It's not just a single uh, six-month evaluation. This is a lifelong evaluation. And I think this is the only way that we will know exactly what's happening. 
I think it's a very important one. It's 350,000 a year for, fi uh, for five years, co-funded, obviously, as I said, by Movember. At the end of five years, as with most grants, funding stops, but you will be, have been expected to have developed or to have shown sustainability uh, during that five-year period. Very, very important. The National Cancer Registry of Ireland is heavily involved in this, and they are going to be uh, holding the data and, and collecting it. So it's, a, it's really an all-Ireland thing and based very much on this whole concept of collaboration and patient-centered research. This is ICHOM, which is the International Consortium for Health Outcomes Measurement from uh, Harvard University. And uh, we have uh, many interactions with them. And it struck us that, you know, if they're uh, here and they're a big organization, uh, they want to help, they're very, very keen to help, uh, then that's fine. Let's use their good offices. And so they have been delighted to hear that we're doing this, uh, this work and so, as I say, want to help. But the aim is to improve outcomes, to reduce overall costs, and of course to increase value. And the, this is the track. You don't have to look at it too much, but you can see at the bottom everything is aimed towards health outcomes because this is the real world experience. So what this is trying to uh, capture is the real world, the real life experience of the patient out there. And of course, not necessarily reported to the doctor, but reported by the patient himself to nobody in particular, to a computer. And I think that this is definitely a better way forward. So this is the ICHOM, the mechanism is to define a minimum standard set of patient reported outcomes to recommend uh, all providers. And again, there are the, the three tiers, there's health status, the process of recovery, and the sustainability of health. So that's essentially it. it if a patient tells me after I, my, radical, my outstandingly performed, my beautiful, wonderful radical prostatectomy, that he has absolutely no incontinence and absolutely no impotence, of course I write that down as a 100% success rate. But is that exactly what he means, or is that just what he's telling me? Because this, again, is something that we're trying to capture. This is the data collection, and as I say, it's going to be on a, uh, an individual but uh, anonymous basis. And so the patient-reported outcomes, again, make the point for the, <clears throat> the patient-centered research. And these are the questionnaires, uh, both prostate cancer-specific and general health, um, and in fact, uh, the, uh, with the help of ICHOM, we've selected uh, these two. Uh, now, they selected them with uh, uh, input from many places around the world. The EPIC 26 questionnaire for prostate cancer itself and the EORTC QLQC 30 for the general health of the patient. I'm just showing you these here. We don't need to look at them. The other area that we mentioned this morning, which is extremely important, is health inequalities. And again, this has been a bugbear of mine because I have done a lot of work on just what we were talking about this morning on the management of prostate cancer in the over 70s. It struck me that in a disease which the median age of diagnosis is in the late 60s and the median age of dying is in the late 70s, why are these people not being treated properly? And you can say what you like, but they are not being treated properly. Uh, the SEER data, uh, which were looked at this morning, but we're, if we look at them from a different way, is what are people doing? Um, and the paper was written by David Penson uh, uh, and, uh, from Vanderbilt. And he looked at that once you get over the age of 70, in fact, the treatment dropped off. People were not being treated properly. Linda and her group wrote a very good paper published in the British Journal of Cancer earlier this year on what is it like in Ireland. And as a matter of fact, it's the same in Ireland as it is in the UK. People say, oh, well, I treat prostate cancer based on comorbidities and I don't use the time clock as being the thing that will actually decide what I will do for patients. Untrue. It's based on age. I think I'm right in saying that. Linda's nodding her head. People base their treatment on the age of the patient and that's wrong 
And I, th I think that therefore, for that reason, we really need to, to move forward on that particular field. Very important, not only in prostate cancer, but in other types of cancer as well. Survivorship is, of course, the name of the game at the present time, and, and it's a science that has developed and uh, uh, without actually a, a specifically, uh, without a specific uh, definition of what survivorship means. But anyway, we generally know what it means now, and this is something that uh, we are involved in a joint funding scheme with the Medical Research Charities Group and also, again, with the Health Research Board. And again, I think this is a very exciting way forward. This is uh, looking at survivorship, um, a specific focus, a focus on outcomes, and again, how does the patient feel uh, to be a survivor of, with cancer? What does it mean? Do we know what it means? Well, this hopefully will tell us in a bit more detail. In fact, we're having a, a, a survivorship research day, and uh, I, I uh, would welcome you to it. This is going to be from the, uh, in the Aviva Stadium, uh, where normally you would expect to see uh, the Irish rugby team beating, no, uh, playing uh, the other rugby teams. <laughs> but anyway, that's what we're going to be doing. So, I hope that I've given you a, a feel for what the Irish Cancer Society is doing. But really, this is a, a, a summary. But essentially, what I feel is that increasingly patients are going to have their say heard. They are going to have more of a role to play in the design of trials and also in the, exactly the sort of patients that should be put into trials. I, I, I really do believe this. If the patients are paying for a lot of the research that's being done, why shouldn't they have that role? As they get more and more uh, educated in relation to health, uh, which they will, they will definitely want a voice. And that is something that we would encourage in the Irish Cancer Society. Thank you very much indeed.